Good morning, everyone. All right. Hope everyone's gotten some breakfast, some coffee, is ready to go. It's the beginning of Ungo Week. Um, so, so thanks for being here today, and it's wonderful to see this level of interest in this topic. Um, and we have an exciting and full program this morning, so I really want to get underway. Uh, so we and, and take your seats, get settled, sit back, relax. My name's Tony Pippa. I'm a senior fellow in global economy and development at the Brookings Institution. Uh, my scholarship at Brookings actually supports work on the SDGs by local leaders in the United States, and I'll be acting as sort of our master of ceremonies this morning. Um, but given that the SDG Summit starts tomorrow, we're excited about this opportunity to hear from leaders from different segments of American society uh, about their contributions to advancing the SDGs. So before we dive in, uh, and I turn it over to the president of the Brookings Institution, John Allen, just a few logistics. Uh, if you like what you hear this morning, uh, we encourage you to share it on Twitter and other social media. Um, we're using the hashtag USA for SDGs. Um, uh, the event is also being videotaped. We'll share that posting with you uh, once we put it out. And we'd actually ask you to share that widely. And we'll also offer you opportunities to continue to engage on this topic uh, as we go forward. Um, before we formally get the program underway, some acknowledgments are in order. I'd like to thank the UN Foundation, which has been a great partner on this, um, and congratulate Kathy Calvin for, as CEO for the leadership she's shown to the foundation, and also offer my congratulations to Elizabeth Cousins, who will be the incoming CEO, um, uh, and continue the partnership we've had on the SDGs even from the, from the US government. I'd also like to really acknowledge Casey Brown, uh, who's had a big vision for this as well, and her team in putting this together. Thank you, Casey. Um, and also like to part acknowledge the partnership of the Rockefeller Foundation as well, since uh, Raj will be up here. Um, they've supported many scholars at Brookings actually working on the SDGs, and, and we also did a, a, a convening yesterday uh, with, with uh, leaders from all over the world talking about how we can accelerate and advance uh, progress on the SDGs. Uh, so to formally get our program underway and uh, offer some welcoming remarks, I'd like to turn it over to John Allen, president of the Brookings Institution. Thank you for being here, John. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and it's wonderful to be with you this morning. It, this is a group of leaders that are making a huge difference in this world. It gets more difficult every single day, and our leadership, our collective leadership, and our collective views on how to move forward on SDGs, I think, is at the heart of the future of our country and the future of the world. Tony, thank you for this welcome. The UN General Assembly is a time for world leaders to come together to discuss our most pressing, pressing challenges. While much attention will be focused on those leaders' statements from the floor of the UN, the summits throughout the week are equally important for generating action. In moments just down the street, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez will open a climate summit that calls for more ambitious actions from governments, from private businesses from civil society and citizens to tackle climate change. Tomorrow will mark the beginning of the SDG Summit, where heads of state from around the world will collectively review global progress on the SDGs. It is the first high-level check-in of its kind and something that is scheduled to happen every four years from now until 2030. The SDGs, a collective commitment agreed upon by the member countries of the United Nations, strongly reflect American values. Their focus on leaving no one and no community behind and their grounding in human rights, access to justice and democratic governance as well as environmental sustainability reflect a vision of sustainable development and echoes the ideals that have guided our own American growth and prosperity. But sadly, the U.S. is the only OECD and G20 country that has not volunteered to report within the UN and its SDG progress. Uh, to call this a disappointment would be a significant understatement, yet hope remains. I often make the distinction between U.S. leadership and American leadership. And examples are that cities and state governments 
universities and philanthropies, corporations and NGOs from the United States are actively engaged on advancing SDGs locally and globally, and they're exhibiting leadership on issues of human rights, social equity, climate change, and sustainability. There are American leaders and American institutions empowered by a shared commitment to values and the greater good of our international community. Our aim is to focus on that leadership today and to learn about its contributions to social and global progress. We'll hear how New York City's and Hawaii's early and pioneering work to advance the SDGs locally has enabled their global engagement with peers. We'll hear how Verizon and the Rockefeller Foundation have unleashed innovation and progress across different sectors, and how multiple institutions in Pittsburgh are engaged in renewal of a post-industrial American city in, the line, in line with the SDGs, and that's a remarkable story. These are just a microcosm of the full breadth of SDG and American leadership in the United States. They echo other efforts, like our partnership with Conrad Hilton Foundation, and the mayor's office in Los Angeles, where Mayor Eric Garcetti has made clear commitments on ending homelessness and promoting gender equality and equity, and, and, the, city's, and the city has launched a first-of-its-kind open-source SDG dashboard. Or how Orlando's Mayor Buddy Dyer's team is using SDGs as a basis for a regional economic resilience plan across multiple counties and municipalities. Corporations from Walmart to Mars, investors like CalPERS and PIMCO, and foundations like the Gates Foundation are all committed to advancing their SDGs through their important work. And while individual educational institutions as diverse as Occidental College, Arizona State University, and Spelman College are providing opportunities for their students to work on the SDGs locally, universities are also coming together collectively through initiatives like the U.S. Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which started last year, and the University Global Compact, which just launched at the Rockefeller Foundation last night. Ladies and gentlemen, the more we align ourselves with important and uniform, uh, unifying international norms like the SDGs, the better the outcome will be, not just for the United States, but for the world. This is also, by the way, what the American public believes. Seven in 10 Americans say it is best for the future of the United States to have an active part in world affairs. This collective action reflects the spirit and the desire for engagement by the American public and the intrinsic American leadership found in so many places in the United States today and hopefully again in the world. So to get us started, I'm pleased to introduce Kathy Calvin, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation, and Hans Vestberg, CEO of Verizon Communications, and Raj Shah, President of the Rockefeller Foundation, to discuss how their global institutions are advancing this vital agenda. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and you're most welcome here. Good morning. Hello, where would you like? Hi, everybody. Uh, why don't you guys on sit on side. either side? Okay. okay. Good. So, it's thank five you. Five seats and three people. So, you can here. sit here. <laughs> okay, sit okay. Here. I didn't know, okay. you know. It's <laughs> oh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, sorry, got it. All right. We're all here because we're so hungry for this kind of connection here in the United States. And, John, thank you for that great call about how this is about American values, because it is. The SDGs are about as American as apple pie. And we knew that in 2015 when we engaged in the My World survey in the United States with our UNA USA chapters. And they were talking about all the same things that were being talked about in Benin and Niger and Thailand and elsewhere. These are global issues and this country needs to be part of it. And so I'm, I'm happy to see that we're pulling this together this year. And I'm thinking we're going to do it every year because it's only going to get bigger and leadership is at the American level and that's great. So these two guys are thought leaders in the work that's been done in this space. Hans Vestberg was a champion of an ICT goal, actually. Yeah, number yeah. 18, never yeah. showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm not sure what I'm doing in a panel, I failed. 
<laughs> but instead, they adopted ICT in all the goals. Yes. So I yeah, think you yeah, won. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I was Thank good. You. And he Thank was at you. Ericsson then and is now the chairman and CEO of Verizon, a large American company. And so we'll hear about that. Raj Shah obviously was at USAID when the goals were being adopted and led the way America shows up around the world, but has also been at the Gates Foundation, is now running Rockefeller Foundation, which has put the SDGs smack at the middle of their work. And that's fantastic. And congratulations. So I want to start with a question to you guys about the value proposition for Americans. And, and do we have it right? Do we need to talk about it in some different ways? And how do we do it without leadership from the top, but exactly what John said, with leadership from all sectors across, across the board? So let me talk to, turn to you first, Raj. Sure. Well, thank you, Kathy, and thanks for all you've done to make both the goals real and the UN accessible to thank the rest you. of the world. Yeah. So <laughs> on both accounts, we, we give you, you a huge shout out um, knowing that transition. Uh, and Hans, thank you for your leadership. Goal 17 does, in fact, you know, is the, the sort of all yeah. of the above yeah. goal, <laughs> right? So, uh, so you're, you're reflected in there. I, I, I was reflecting on, on what the goals actually stand for. You know, 17 things is just too many things to summarize. And to me, uh, there are a set of goals that really make the point that by 2030, people shouldn't have to live in pure subsistence poverty and all of the violence, insecurity, uh, violation of human rights, and deprivation that that comes with. Uh, embedded in the goals is also this notion that as we build a global economy together, it needs to be inclusive of communities left behind and women in particular. Uh, and, and the indicators really do ask for that, countries to report on that. Uh, and then, you know, uh, there are four or five goals that are fundamentally about climate and climate action, uh, broadly defined. And so to me, those basic concepts, the dignity of every person, inclusive economies that uh, recognize that if people are left behind, we cannot go forward and build a productive global economy, and our climate represents an existential threat that we have to deal with, and I know Hans is off next to the climate summit, yeah. th those are more important today than they were when the goals were ratified. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think four million young people in the streets last week illustrate that people get it instinctively. Personally, I, I find 17 goals too hard to conceptualize and communicate. And uh, you know, I think we probably ought to rethink how we talk about them. Because these are not about solving poverty in lower income countries. That's not what the goals are about. They are specifically about every country really tethering themselves against those three objectives. And the, you know, the lack of political leadership we see today uh, to achieve the goals, the walking away from multilateral institutions, the undermining of alliances uh, that sort of defines our, uh, our politics these days uh, is, in my view, all driven by the reality of those three concepts. And so we need the goals now more than ever. We need companies and philanthropies and governments to do more now uh, than they ever have before. And it's precisely in that moment where we're having this big retrenchment at the political level that's going to make it very, very, very hard to actually achieve the goals. Hans. Hmm. Um, now, I think that for a corporation is a little bit different. I mean, you, you can, I mean, first of all, you realize that you have a huge responsibility to lead a company in our size. Uh, 140, 150,000 employees. Uh, <clears throat> so of course uh, you, you start there, and I think for us it's, it, it's so normal. You know, I, first of all, I, I I love philanthropy, and I think it's great. But for a corporation, that's not what you do when you work in society. It's part of your strategy. Uh, it's a purpose of the company, what you do every day. Then it becomes important, and uh, I think that at least what I found. The last one and a half year running Verizon, we have a, such an energy in the in the company around doing right and doing great things. But we do it for two reasons. One, it's our business. I mean that we do technology for uh, hundreds of schools and millions of children. It's our strategy. But it's also actually doing something good in the U.S. We we go to under, underserved uh, communities where they don't have connectivity in the school. We bring in. That's just one example. But I think corporation, at least how 
I see it, we think about it, this is part of our strategy. So you do it because it's part of strategy, but you also do it because it's your bloody responsibility as a, as a leader in today's society. And ultimately, you're going to be judged by your shareholders, by your employees, and by your customers if you don't, don't do right. And I think that's, at least for me, is an enormous trend we have seen the last 15 years. I usually say I came to Davos the first time 2007 or 8 or something like that. And, you know, I felt very alone talking about Millennium Development Goals, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, today, you know, any corporation would do it, but I think that the, the corporation should do, as you said, they need to find their way in the 17 goals. This is part of our strategy. It's not nothing, you know, we do something here on the side that says, hey, it's probably important, but, you know, we, this is the company. It has to be embedded. And I think that's when you get both the right impact and you do the right for all your stakeholders, not only the society. And I think that's what at least we have found in Verizon and the last year been a fantastic rally around these ty type of things. But it's connected to our strategy. We do it for our shareholders as well. So other companies haven't come along as fast. And I knew you're meeting with companies this week to make the case. Yeah. European companies may be further along. What's, what, what do we need to do to make that argument, particularly in local communities. You need to demystify what, what this is all about. I mean, uh, many corporations say, no, we don't have time for that. I think it's much more about, hey, this is part of your strategy. This is part of how you act as a 21st century corporation with big responsibility. And then suddenly you see that many corporations are doing a lot of great work. You just need to funnel it and do the right things. And I, I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to gather <clears throat> a lot of CEOs, CEOs on here on Thursday together with Global Citizen and we're going to launch uh, quite big uh, ambitions for 2020 where you only have 10 years left for the, uh, for the, the SDGs. So uh, hopefully, and it's mainly or it's only American companies basically. Uh, so yes, we're going to rally that together with Global Citizen and uh, so that's going to be an exciting way of, of sharing what we all are doing. But again, it should not be the same. It should be part of our strategies. Hans is a board member of the United Nations Foundation. This is what we love about this attitude and strategy. So, you know, you, uh, you both mentioned the MDGs, and I, I think philanthropy sort of sat out the MDGs in some weird ways that just were frustrating, but are starting to show up more in the SDGs. But where do you think philanthropy needs to go, both at the community level, where it would be so great to see community foundations, but also at the, at the global and national level? Well, I, you know, I, I agree with that assessment of the SDGs, and I think part of the challenge for philanthropy in general is, you know, there's no quarterly earnings call or <laughs> annual reporting process, and, and so you get to choose whatever you want to do. I think at this point, we've said the sustainable development goals are the things we have to do as humanity to really uh, protect our planet and build the kind of interconnected economy that is inclusive of everyone. So for us, when we did our strategic planning, we said, okay, our health initiative is about bringing data science and artificial intelligence to the task of accelerating progress against MD SDG3, mm -hmm. uh, specifically saving six million <clears throat> women and children's lives. Our effort, which we call Smart Power, which is investing in solar and mini grids uh, around the world to provide energy access to those who, don't, who still live in the dark, is about bringing 300 million people uh, electrification using renewable power, and that's about SDG 7. So I think at this point, if you're, a, if you're in philanthropy or the NGO sector and you can align against big, measurable, we have a preference for quantitative goals, uh, they ought to align with the SDGs. And in food, in energy, in health, uh, we're able to do that. Even our work in the United States, which focuses on the 90 million Americans that are in households that work full time, uh, headed by someone working full time but still cannot make ends meet and live in working poverty, we think that that is a solvable problem in the United States. That tracks against the SDG and primarily is women-headed households. Yeah. Uh, and so, so SDG 5 in particular. So I, I feel like it ought to be possible for most philanthropies to say these are the these are how our efforts map to these goals we're asking that of business yes right if we're asking that of business and of Hans who does have quarterly earnings calls yes I have and can spend the week doing <laughs> every this, quarter and we ought to be able to lead by example yeah. and to me uh, too few US philanthropies are, have, have done that yeah and it's a shift in long-term versus short-term thinking in any sector that's a challenge I know you got to run talk about 
data and you've raised data and technology and both in closing the awareness gap but also in delivering because it's going to take that to get to 20. Yeah, no, I always talk about uh, the 21st century's infrastructure is actually mobility, uh, uh, broadband and cloud. Basically, with that combination, uh, you don't, uh, you don't need to think about where you are, where you live, where you're born, because suddenly you can deliver it. So I think that the whole idea of seeing that we get the total digital inclusion is for me sort of a, a must, uh, sort of a platform for all the 17 goals. Uh, and of course, then data comes into place because suddenly you get the information, you can access to it, uh, you can healthcare, education, whatever it might be, equality, because you have equally much information if you're male or a female. Uh, and we have seen some really, Worrying signs when it comes to studies around that, that mail has much more uh, access to data or, or connectivity. So all of it is in there. And of course, data then needs to be treated well because we have also our privacy rules that we need to be very careful with in this world. But their anonymous data can help so much when it comes to uh, whatever the health or whatever. So we just need to find a model for de dealing with it because we cannot scale as we have done in some countries like where I come from or this country, with the infrastructure is just built from the bottom up in all countries to actually combat some of the biggest challenges on this earth. It just has to be mobility, broadband and cloud. And then we just need to also be very sensitive to the, the challenges when using data or using uh, technology. But that cannot stop it. It has to just uh, be the, the fundamental infrastructure for us to be able to, to combat some of these ch challenges. Great. I'm going to ask you both for a quick round uh, just at the end so you can get to the UN. What's making you most uh, optimistic? And I know we all want to be optimists here, and, and, and these are two really optimistic uh, ask, guys. Ask me to be most optimistic. I'm constantly optimistic. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think that what I've seen uh, among my peers, uh, companies, I mean, all are talking like me uh, today. They then different uh, corporation articulated differently, but everyone starts to understand if you need a purpose-driven company uh, but you, and you have your four stakeholders in where you have shareholders, customers, employees and society, and actually they hang together. You, you cannot sort of compromise in between them because ultimately you're going to fail on, on the totality. And I think that understanding is uh, that that's encouraging me. and. Uh, but, you know, it's a lot of hard work and it's uh, far away from solvable or solved today. So we, we just need to continue. I'm optimistic because Bill Gates said a long time ago, Mike, he started Microsoft during a recession. <laughs> and right now we have a recession of political leadership uh, and probably a soon to be an actual recession. But we'll leave that to something else. Uh, but, you didn't hear it here. Uh, but in, in, that, in that environment, which is a recession of political leadership. Like it used to be the case that we were fighting on the global stage for the opportunity to lead to achieve 0.7%, to, to make sure that we had a $100 billion climate fund to do the Paris Accords, to do the SDGs themselves. Uh, that was the culmination of a lot of optimistic engagement around what globalization could mean for everybody. And you know, shortly thereafter with Brexit and, and the election in the United States, We've seen a tremendous retrenchment, and no one should be, uh, everyone should be clear eyed about the extent to which that undermines this enterprise. That said, it is in that moment that business leaders set, step up and sign the, the, the roundtable declaration that we should be multi stakeholder in our governments. It's in that moment that philanthropies say, okay, maybe we can't just do our own thing and we should align against the SDGs in a quantitative, measurable, transparent way. It's in that moment that four million kids show up, or young people show up to protest and say, we, we have a, a voice in this effort. And I think when our politics corrects, ourself, <laughs> corrects itself, which I believe it will, we will have a much more durable, much more engaged, much more multi-stakeholder effort to solve climate, to solve poverty, and to solve inclusiveness in our economy. And that will set us up to be really successful in the long run. Well, wow. and it's a moment when cities are taking the lead, and that's a that's community thing that we really want to celebrate, and we'll move to the next panel. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. And good luck on Ungo Week. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you again, Hans and, and Raj, uh, both for being here, but also your leadership. 
leadership of, uh, of U.S. institutions and, and how they're advancing the SDGs. Very interesting to hear about the integration with strategy, with quantitative metrics, with ways of thinking about societal impact, but also about the importance of collective leadership and, uh, and multilateral efforts. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to, uh, and Kathy was just referencing, uh, local leadership on the SDGs. We're here in New York, host city of the United Nations, and I wanna turn to and introduce uh, Penny Abiwardenia, who's the Commissioner for International Affairs for New York City, and she's been helping lead New York City's efforts uh, to contribute to the SDGs and also engage globally. So um, a few words from Penny, thank you. Thank you. So good to have you here. Hi everyone, welcome to New York City and the UN General Assembly. New Yorkers are slowly coming to terms with the fact that we're the greatest city in the world in part because we can put up with this traffic. So <laughs> thank you to the UN Foundation and to the Brookings Institute for bringing us together today. Now, as you all know, we are in a time when some national governments are repeatedly abdicating their responsibility on the most pressing global challenges. This vacuum of leadership has created a new sense of urgency, one that New York City and municipalities around the world have chosen to define as an opportunity. Where national leadership is absent, cities are championing the values of fairness, inclusion, and cooperation on the global stage. These values are reflected right here in New York City in the progressive policies the de Blasio administration has catalyzed throughout the communities that we serve. As host to the UN and the largest diplomatic corps in the world, we know that we're uniquely positioned to amplify the voices of local and regional governments while making the link between local and global issues. In April 2015, Mayor de Blasio committed New York City to one NYC, a groundbreaking strategic plan on inclusive and sustainable growth. This strategy assessed New York City's significant challenges and charted a path forward to achieve goals such as lifting 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty. Now later that year, we all know that the world leaders gathered at the UN headquarters in New York to agree to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And we immediately mapped the synergies between 1NYC to the SDGs and launched Global Vision Urban Action. We actually did it right here thanks to Darren's support in December 2015. Global Vision Urban Action is a platform that is designed expressly to connect New York City's sustainability and development efforts to the SDGs, as well as create a platform to be able to share best practices beyond borders. Cities are where the challenges of climate and inequality and other issues are often most intensely felt. But more importantly, it's also where innovative solutions can be developed in collaboration between local governments, private sector, and uh, civil society. Now, critical to the success of Global Vision Urban Action was our belief that the SDGs provide us with a common language and framework to collaborate on solutions beyond borders, no matter the size or region. Since 2015, we've hosted a series of conferences and site visits that bring together experts and thought leaders working to advance the SDGs at the local level on topics ranging from mental health to water management and gender equity. Now, it was important for us to go beyond this policy work. We had to turn the SDGs into a reality for the most important among us, the New York City taxpayer. Now, why do the SDGs matter to them? To address this, we launched the New York City Junior Ambassador Program, also in 2015, to help enable our most vulnerable youth throughout our five boroughs to learn about the SDGs and then do something about it in their own neighborhood. We knew that activating young people would result in intergenerational conversations about the meaning and value of both the UN and the SDGs in the lives of New Yorkers. We have New York City Junior Ambassadors who are committed to SDG 14, Life Underwater, and their commitment is to clean up the South Bronx River. So now let's fast forward to 2018. Americans at this point were, well, living in their new American reality. For the more dramatic among us, Act 4 of, Greek of our <laughs> Greek tragedy. Again, our sense of urgency here in New York City was an opportunity to figure out how we can con continue to innovate and have impact. We knew that our national government was never going to submit a voluntary national review, the process in which member states share with the UN and other countries where they are in achieving the SDGs. It's another fun time in New York City called the High Level Political Forum. 
We propose the idea of creating a voluntary local review modeled on the VNR so that as an American city, we could share our leadership on the SDGs. We were pleased to receive positive feedback from the UN Secretary General and other senior UN officials, as well as local civil society groups. This is a team effort, and we were very, very lucky and grateful that the Global Task Force, which is a coalition of city networks, committed to promoting the voluntary local reviews around the world. During the 2018 high-level political forum, we had the honor of presenting to the UN the first ever voluntary local review. It is very important to note here that this is not an effort to undermine or usurp member state sovereignty, and that this is an effort among others that are here to achieve the global goals. To reinforce this point, Helsinki was the second city to commit to doing a voluntary local review, and the Finnish government has since enthusiastically advocated for cities and towns all across Finland to participate in the voluntary local review process. And I'm proud to stand here today and say that the VLR is a movement. We are now calling on local and regional governments around the world to join us in this effort by formally committing to the New York City Declaration on the Voluntary Local Review, which we will officially launch at the UN on Wednesday morning. From Cape Town and Accra to Kazan, Russia and Orlando, Florida, we know that our voice matters and we're speaking up. We've also secured the support of validators and partners who are actively helping to amplify the voluntary local review and call local and regional governments to do a voluntary local review. This includes the UN Foundation, Brookings, UN Habitat, C40, Global Citizen, Project Everyone, the World Economic Forum. Again, this is a team effort. New York City has ensured that the barrier to entry is low for doing a voluntary local review. Joining the movement does not require additional funding or data collection. It can be done in a time frame of each government's choosing that is in line with existing planning processes. So please spread the word and please join us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Penny. And as you heard, a good bit of American innovation there pioneering a voluntary local review, something that really, uh, and I'm, uh, I can uh, attest to what Penny said, something that's really caught fire and is now becoming a global movement, um, and which is exciting because it really is at the local level where these goals, which can sometimes seem a little theoretical or aspirational, become uh, solving real problems for real people in real communities. Um, and, uh, and wonderful to New York and, and their leadership. Um, they saw early on through their own city strategy how it aligned to the SDGs and then decided to, to let the world know and their, their own citizens know um, that they were part of a global movement and, and how, um, as we began this conversation, how those SDGs also reflect what's important for American communities and, and American values. So now I'd like to turn and hear a little bit more from a group of stakeholders from Pittsburgh uh, about how the work that's going on in Pittsburgh uh, reflects the SDGs and how the SDGs provide a, a basis for that. So I'll turn to Ashok Regmi, who's the, um, he's the Director of Social Innovation and Citizenship at the International Youth Foundation, uh, and ask our, our participants from Pittsburgh to take the stage. And we're waiting on one more participant, uh, who in the midst of uh, New York traffic is on his way. <laughs> And Penny, you know, we know that this is New York during Ungo Week. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, what a great morning to be sitting next to a UN building where uh, head of states are talking about the progress of SDGs. And here we are at the Center for Social Justice at Ford Foundation um, talking about how a very complex interconnected framework like sustainable development goals is taking roots in local level. Uh, um, and actually, it, SDGs were designed um, to be applicable for all of us, um, as compared to its predecessor like MDG, which is more uh, dependent on uh, aid. Um, I think the SDG framework is more about how do you unlock the social, human capital, the social capital, the economic capital of each of our communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to have an illustrious uh, panel here from Pittsburgh. Um, as Tony said, we're waiting for uh, 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 Mayor Peduto to join us. He's on the way. But let me just quickly introduce 
uh, Lisha Schroeder. She's the president of Pittsburgh Foundation. Uh, David Feingold, president of Chatham University. Uh, James Garrett, provost of Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and Anne Cudd, provost and senior vice chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so to my colleagues on the panel, we have about 25 minutes to prove that uh, Pittsburgh could be a model city. Uh, so I, I, I would encourage you to keep your answers short so that we can have a, 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 a good conversation. So let me just go um, uh, to uh, provost uh, uh, sorry, uh, James Garrett uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, your university recently made some serious commitments around SDGs in a, in a kind of on a systems organizational level. Uh, could you share with us what those are and why now? Thank you, Ashwin. First, let me th oh, sure. thank you. First, let me thank the UN Foundation and the Brookings Institute for uh, hosting this event. It's an important reminder during these chaotic times, that American leadership comes in many forms. Uh, now, at, at Carnegie Mellon, we have a long-standing history of making real and practical impact, not only within our campus community, but also throughout the world. Uh, we have to be good stewards and active participants in improving our campus, local, and global environments. Sustainability is one of our university's core values. We have a shared commitment to lead by example in preserving and protecting our natural, natural resources. But we also recognize from the conception of the SDGs that sustainability is more than just about natural resources. Our university's focus is on education, research, and uh, practice in building environmentally sustainable uh, and peaceful just communities. We're building on two decades of an, of an engaged effort to support a broader definition of sustainability. So while we have a long history of practicing sustainability efforts on our campus, many of our members of our community as well as local residents are unaware of the 17 sustainable development goals or how these goals represent a wide-reaching set of opportunities for global impact. So earlier this month, Carnegie Mellon launched a new campus sustainability initiative. What this initiative recognizes is that universities such as ours have an invaluable role to play in achieving the sustainable development goals, to live up to our institution's responsibility in ensuring that progress is made towards achieving these goals. Today, we announce these six commitments. We commit to educate CMU students around the world about the SDGs, recognizing that this framework applies to all of us and represents a special opportunity to create more peaceful, a more peaceful, prosperous planet with just and inclusive societies. We commit to help solve pressing problems brought to light by the SDG framework by acting boldly taking risks, and applying creativity. We commit to do this work collaboratively, an approach that's deeply embedded in our university culture. We commit that through education, research, partnerships, and operational activities, that we will demonstrate advancements of the SDGs at Carnegie Mellon University. We commit to create a voluntary university review of work being done at CMU and we'll report these findings in New York as the UN General Assembly meets next year. We therefore commit to do more to align our work with the SDGs and build on the good work already done by CMU faculty, students, staff, and alumni, whether focused on mitigating climate change, eliminating food waste, reducing violence, or ending human trafficking. We want Carnegie Mellon to have, an, uh, the Carnegie Mellon community, to have an understanding of the broad definition of sustainability. The SDGs are an opportunity to advance peaceful, just, and inclusive societies where no one is left behind. We want to make sure that our community members realize that we share responsibility for this aspirational agenda and as individuals and as a community can have real impactful difference in our world. So our university's passion lies 
in work that matters. Carnegie Mellon is proud to take on a leadership role alongside institutions and, and city governments, including our own, in advancing the SDGs. We have and will look for opportunities to include sustainability values in our education, financial planning, research, community engagement opportunities, and through our partners and external stakeholders. Provost Garrett, thank you, because um, I think doing a voluntary local review probably would be the first university doing it. Uh, um, it shows the kind of leadership that Carnegie Mellon is showing. And one thing that stands out to me is, is, is uh, if you look at SDGs, you have a post-MDG goals, then you have a climate cu cluster. But sometimes it's very hard as, an in, uh, as, a, as, as a global community to really look at the concept of just, peaceful, and inclusive societies. We're talking about how development is done, that nobody's left behind. And the fact that you're using these terminologies to ensure that your institution is also looking at it in, in, in a cohesive way uh, is something very admirable. So thank you for, you for your leadership. Now let me go to to uh, 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 Lisa Schroeder. Uh, Lisa, you, you are uh, new to the uh, oh, uh, Pittsburgh Community Foundation, one of the 30 largest community foundations in the United States, uh, but you're not new to the uh, uh, place-based concept and sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the role of philanthropy, community mm -hmm. philanthropy in particular, um, in aligning um, and working on this agenda, and what are some of, the work, uh, some of the work that Pittsburgh Foundation is doing around this agenda? Yeah, um, very, I'm very proud to be here, I think we all are, um, to speak to the ways that in Pittsburgh, sectors have been coming together for decades to reverse the course of crisis in a, in a great American city. Um, I am a new president at the, at the Pittsburgh Community Foundation, but have worked um, for 20 years in the city um, and have seen that it's all true. It's not buzz. The public, private, nonprofit, and NGO sectors in, come together with universities to make solutions happen on the ground. And I think what's so exciting about this moment today is that we have a chance through the compact of universities that has come together to really mobilize formally and energetically around uh, a decade of very serious implementation, um, digging in to make the SDGs part of uh, not only our discourse, but our action. The Pittsburgh Foundation has a 75-year tradition of working toward the the, the um, in intrinsic goals of the SDGs for vulnerable populations to erase poverty in all its form and to make opportunity accessible to everyone. What is uh, unique about a community foundation is that in the law and under the tax code, we are the keepers of community investments. We're a charitable organization that uh, that, that at this point um, today shepherds more than 2,300 funds contributed by regionally focused donors, individuals, and families who have the interest of the future um, of, of of the region at heart. Um, that gives us a tremendous platform. So there are two things that I think the Pittsburgh Foundation can bring uh, to, to this compact. One is that we have a tremendous uh, history and also a latitude through the interest of the commitment of our donors to work in all of the areas of SDGs to achieve justice and sustainability and, and economic opportunity um, and, and to address Address climate change. Um, we we also have a, a, a ability to advocate and convene, and many of you may know that Pittsburgh is is famous, and it's all true for having a very robust. A philanthropic community. We have a tremendous number of foundations, uh, most of whom are focused in local and, and regional action at home. Um, and I am finding that my peers in the foundation community are very eager to have the Pittsburgh Foundation use the ability that we have 
under law to convene parties coming together and, and to advocate for the kinds of change from policy right down to the to compliance and standards advocacy that people have spoken so beautifully to this morning. So I could not be more excited for 10 years of, of uh, continued action, and I think Pittsburgh can continue to be a leader in how to make change for everyone. Thank you, Lisa. The, look, the, power, the power of advocacy in really, we have 10 years and continuing to kind of bring it on the forefront um, on the local level, aligning the work of many of the philanthropies you talked about in Pittsburgh is so key. So thank you. Um, now let me go to Provost uh, Cut and President Feingold. And this is a question for both of you. Uh, um, at the, I work for the International Youth Foundation along with Sarah Mendelson um, at the Carnegie Mellon University. We are working on an initiative called Cohort 2030, which is about investing in the next generation, primarily born after 1980, who bring a certain set of value system of equity, justice, their view around LGBTQ issues, environment. Um, and we have put a bet on the next generation to really demand and deliver. On, on some of these major goals that is, uh, that is under what uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And you both represent institutions which are in the business of molding the mindset of the next generation to be scholars, practitioners, researchers who are going to question the status quo. Uh, talk to us a bit about where do you see the role of universities in your context of working with your uh, researchers, faculty members, students to really take this agenda to the next level and aligning it with a, a, a you know, ten year, a generational um, framework. Shall I start? Okay. Yeah. Well, first, let me also say how inspiring it is to be here uh, representing the University of Pittsburgh on this uh, uh, very distinguished panel. And one of the really special things about Pittsburgh, I think, is how universities and the city and the foundations all work together cooperatively, and I think that's represented very well on this stage, or it will be as soon as our mayor comes. <laughs> um, but uh, let me also express our strong commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. We take very seriously our mission to educate uh, young people, future leaders, to lead lives of impact, to make a real difference um, in the way that uh, Ashok was talking about. And the, the, the SDGs I see as a real, uh, outstanding guide and framework by which we can plan and frame what we're doing both at Pitt and in Pittsburgh and in the world. Um, in preparing these remarks, I was uh, struck by uh, how many ways uh, we address all of the sustainable development goals throughout our education and our engagement of our students in our community. Um, but having just a few minutes, I wanted to give you just a few examples of, of some of the, the ways that we're addressing the goals. So um, naturally, in our wheelhouse is goal four, the quality education. Um, and uh, we have 14 students who've been selected to be Millennium Fellows, um, joining together with uh, the, that um, uh, Millennium Campus Network uh, to focus on UN SDG goals uh, as part of the United Nations Academic Initiative. But not only are, are students uh, furthering the sustainable development goals, but as an institution, we're committed also to improving access to quality higher education. And one of the way th ways that we're doing this, um, we've just announced a new financial aid program called uh, Pitt Success, in which uh, we match federal Pell Grants uh, and also uh, lower, uh, limit the unmet financial need of our students. And in the first few months of this initiative, we've seen uh, a dramatic increase in the number of uh, Pell eligible students. And in a similar way, we're also committing to our local uh, public school students um, with a public scholars program, uh, all of the valedictorians and salutatorians from the public schools in Pittsburgh uh, are guaranteed freshman admission and uh, a substantial so scholarship support. Um, we're also very committed, of course, to goal five of gender equality. Uh, we're spreading the word about this pr critical goal through curriculum and through our rich scholarly assets uh, in gender studies, global studies, and global health. Um, this fall, we have a global studies class that focuses on SDG 5, uh, considering global health and gender equality, which brings together expertise from Carnegie Mellon University, as well as the University of Pittsburgh, as well as practitioners to understand uh, and address the issues surrounding global health and gender. 
um, this course is going to uh, bring together the students to create a, a, a policy memo as the deliverable of that course. Um, and just last Friday, we had a global town hall, uh, our second annual one, um, on UN and global governance reform. Um, this year's event was uh, focused on climate, gender, and sustainable development, uh, from local activism to global reform. Uh, it focused on the need to think synthetically about climate change and gender equity and sustainability uh, in reimagining agenda, an agenda for global governance reform and reconfiguring uh, citizen activism for social justice. Um, we're working hard as well on, on affordable and clean energy. Pitt has announced a goal of attaining the, at least 50% of its electricity from renewable sources by 2030. And at 14% right now, we, uh, with two on-site solar inst installations, uh, the university recently committed to purchasing all of the electricity to be generated by the first low-impact hydropower facility uh, built on Pittsburgh's Three Rivers in over three decades. Uh, this facility will be built at an existing lock on the Allegheny River and will provide an additional 25% of the university's annual electricity usage, which will put us close to the goal. And finally, I'll just say a little bit about Goal 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. Um, Pitt's neighborhood commitments uh, build stronger communities and a stronger university uh, based on our long-term place-based strategies. Uh, two community engagement centers have been established in partnership with residents and stakeholders in traditionally underserved neighborhoods where the university has made long-term commitments of investment, infrastructure, programming, and staffing. Uh, crucially, we're committed to listening to our, the needs of our neighborhood residents and letting them take the lead in setting the agenda for, uh, for Pitt's uh, engagement with them. So uh, wh what's bringing all this together is our commitment as a university to the city of Pittsburgh, to our students, and to making the world uh, a better place. And I think that the SDGs uh, provide an outstanding frame for our focus and a common set of goals and language so that we can work together with partners both locally and globally. Thank you, Provost Khan. And, and again, a reflection uh, reminds me of this view of Verizon when he was talking, the need to make uh, the attainment of these goals as a part of your strategy and not something on the side. And just based on what you just talked about, the teaching, the gender equality to even how you do your operations uh, um, is, is, is a testament of how you've integrated into the strategy. Um, and that you're already doing a lot of these things and to have that common framework and language across partners is, 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 is of importance. So thank you, Provost Scott. President Feingold, if you could share some thoughts about what is the relevance of the university uh, from students and faculty side in pushing this agenda forward. Absolutely, and first, thanks again for including us. I'm guessing almost everyone in the room knew Carnegie Mellon and Pitt before they came in. Maybe not everybody's heard of Chatham University, but we've been sort of punching over our weight now. This is our 150th year um, in this area of sustainability. Um, back in uh, 2008, um, we were one of the very first um, institutions in the world to create a school devoted to uh, sustainability. And I think when we think about how we address these issues, we think of it in three interrelated ways. So we think about our education mission, we think about leading by example, and we think about um, what can we do in working with our partners in Pittsburgh and in the community to really learn by doing, because that's what we think the sustainable development goals are all about. So when it comes to education, the Falk School for Sustainability and Environment, not only are we educating undergraduate and master's degrees to understand in a systemic way and solve problems around the sustainable development goals, but we're reaching out more broadly to the community. So we have thousands of K through 12 students who come through and they share projects they're doing in their schools around these goals. And the fun thing is the audience are the local and political leaders from the state level who come in to hear from the students themselves what are the challenges that they're facing and what are their solutions. Uh, we are also working, as we were advised by our commencement speaker, Mary Robinson, last year, who said, you know, the solutions to these challenges are really going to take the elders, like herself and Nelson Mandela, working with this new generation. And so we're working with multi-generational approaches to make them aware and tap their talents for what this might, might, might need. And we ensure that 
absolutely every student, like Carnegie Mellon's new commitment as part of our mission, takes a course on sustainability, whether you're in the health sciences, whether you're in the liberal arts, that everybody understands and is able to apply these approaches. In terms of leading by example, um, I, I misstated earlier, the school was founded in 2012, but in 2008, we undertook a new campus, the Eden Hall campus, which is built out as one of the most sustainable in the world. Basically a living learning lab for sustainability, where food systems, new energy systems, geothermal and solar, where organic agriculture, aquaponics, even built our own artificial uh, wetlands to process the waste of the plant. So this is really a test bed for all of these ways of sustainable living. And it's something that Chatham lives across the university. So we were a charter signatory back a decade ago when the US didn't ratify Kyoto. This was a way for us to say we're on board with universities around the US and around the world to meet a zero emission target. And so Chatham was one of the first 50 signatories to that. And we measure ourselves using the STARS framework, which has been established to look at all of these, not just on our energy use, but on water, on composting, on the environment, and on, on meeting the SDG. But I think the most exciting way we do it and what we find is most effective with this new generation is actually doing the learning by getting out in the communities. And so we work with the Pittsburgh Food Bank run by one of our alums to grow on the Eden Hall campus and distribute that food and enable them to get access to additional resources. We work with the mayor's office in the city on the Food Policy Council to try to see in a, a city that has plenty of food, how do we eradicate hunger? We work and one of my most favorite examples is a student-led one, Natalie Jellison, who came up with a partnership with one of our most effective nonprofits, 412 Rescue, where the food that comes out of our campuses, when it's instead of going to waste, can be picked by anyone up and delivered to somebody who needs it. So reduces the, the, the wastage there and addresses a sustainable development goal. We're doing similar pro projects around the watershed, around thinking about how do we go into our poorest communities and improve air quality and reduce asthma. The ultimate goal of what we're trying to do builds on the legacy of our most famous alum, Rachel Carson. And what I think her career shows is the power still of the liberal arts. If you think about one of the earliest environmental pioneers in the world, right, what made her so powerful it was a deep understanding of science. It was the ability to communicate effectively through eloquent writing, but it was that sense of social justice and the ability to inspire others to change that gave birth to a movement that I would say is why we're all here today. So our goal ultimately at Chatham is we need a new generation of Rachel Carsons if we're gonna solve these issues. Great, thank you. Thank you, President Feinberg. <laughs> One thing that stood out uh, to me uh, um, was when you talked about applying what you have learned in the class, real world application, and I think you know, if these goals were to be met, and if we are in the business of, again, getting the next generation um, be the leaders, um, practitioners, and researchers, it is important for us to look at how do we activate through universities in real world applications of some of these issue areas and that I, we are trying to resolve. I would just clarify a little bit there. I would say it's not so much apply what you learned in the class, it's that the class is actually out At there. The, it's it's exactly. using the community, it's using the campus as the way of learning because that's what, that's what yeah. excites the students when they see the ideas they're working on be put into practice. Excellent, thank you. Now my question is, as, as we wait for the mayor, um, why, this is a, you know, as Raj was saying earlier, it is a 17 goals complex, 167 indicators, I believe, 69, 169 indicators. Uh, um, how do you make it relevant for young people in Pittsburgh, or for that matter, for citizens in Pittsburgh? What, what, what challenge do you see uh, in aligning it with a, a pretty big framework and an opportunity? Well, I maybe jump in quick. So I, I think the nice thing about it is its comprehensiveness. So if you say to a young person, you know, tackle 169, no, no chance. But almost anyone can find at least a few. And of course, there are so many connections among them. So for us, you know, until five years ago, we were an all women's institution. And so 
gender equity, women's education. If you address that, we know you address so many other issues as well around inequality, around food access and other things. And so I think what we say to people is find within this framework the place where you, that connects with you, where you can make it. How you can connect with your own passion points. It's yeah, broad enough. Community. Anybody else? Uh, I, I think the SDGs are an excellent framework for in fact exposing the community to all the different dimensions of sustainability. There were people working on projects that probably weren't thinking, maybe they were, but many weren't thinking about them as being part of this definition of sustainability. Now when we announced our initiative and uh, welcomed students and staff and faculty from all over campus, it was really a, 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 a First, first of all, very exciting and very uh, heartwarming to see how many different people from across the campus in different, diverse different areas were interested in participating. And so I think, uh, to, to David's point, folks are seeing where they fit into this concept of sustainability through the SDGs. I, I don't think at Carnegie Mellon we're going to address all 17 right out of the box. We're going to pri prioritize, identify which ones are uh, ones we can make progress on early and which ones are going to be a heavier lift and, and will need more time over, uh, over a period to be able to make some progress. Lisa? Um, from a foundation standpoint, I uh, completely agree in on um, coming from the passion we we receive proposals from from young people and and activists and nonprofits in the community broadly and what is amazing is how much of the work they are impassioned to do that lines up precisely with the SDGs so I think that alignment goes both ways um, in preparing in, in learning what our foundation currently does that's in alignment um, I sat down with our pro program team who produced a a four-page single-space matrix of all of the projects that are just youth-led, um, youth action on the ground to address the challenges that they are facing, whether it's L LGBT rights or social justice, criminal justice, and the energy that is coming from the community is there, and it is, is, it's palpable, and it's really a, an amazing resource. If I could just briefly add, uh, 17 goals is a lot of goals, but if you look at a university, you have people with passions that address so many different topics, it actually uh, is, is almost uh, not, not enough. So what it, what's great about the 17 goals is that um, the things that we're doing in the universities, um, we have 13 different schools, for example, within the University of Pittsburgh itself. Um, all can be seen as rowing in the same direction yeah, through the, yeah. the 17 Sustainable yeah. Development Goals. Great, thank you. I have been shown a sign of zero there, which means we have to end. But let me just end, end this by saying that, you know, SDGs is pretty, pretty bold. It's, you know, we're talking about not halving, but zero uh, poverty, zero hunger. We're talking about making it, uh, um, making us accountable. And we're talking about just peaceful, inclusive society, which is not part of, you know, MDGs in a way of how uh, we do our business, not just what we do. So what that requires is, is a different kind of leadership, an audacious, courageous leadership, which we see on this panel and which you also see outside, like Greta, the next generation, a leadership that is not just going to focus on uh, doing things right, but actually doing the right thing. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing what Pittsburgh would look like in 2030. Thank you for your work. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ashok, and, uh, and all the leaders from Pittsburgh. It's wonderful to hear about the community of action, I guess I would say, and the collaboration that happens at the local level, um, both within your institutions and what that means for, for the stakeholders and the constituents that you have in your institutions, but also for the community at large uh, and what it's meant for Pittsburgh. And, uh, and congratulations on the commitments and the work that you're doing. Um, to sort of display what it looks like for a U.S. community, an American community, uh, to take on the SDGs in their full breadth, 
Um, those 17 goals, 169 targets, I'm sorry, I'm partly responsible. <laughs> I know it's complicated, it's hard, it's hard to explain. Um, but the integration and the importance of all of those uh, goals working together and what they mean, I think, is really important. So thanks for your leadership and thanks for being here and sharing it with us today. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Celeste Connors, who's the uh, leader of Hawaii Green Growth, to talk a little bit about um, what Hawaii has been doing on this particular agenda. Um, and really the pioneering work, uh, thinking about this from an indigenous culture and the ideas of sustainability and how sustainability actually can be sort of part of the DNA of a community and a way of thinking. Um, but also, uh, similar to New York, how early on they recognized what the uh, opportunity was with the SDGs and how it related to the strategies that as a state and as local communities in Hawaii, they were undertaking on sustainability. So, so let's. So aloha and good morning. Uh, before I start, first of all, I really would like to thank Brookings and the UN Foundation for hosting us. Uh, today, and I'm here as one representative from Hawaii, but I do want to acknowledge our Hawaii delegation. If you could just raise your hands, please. Thanks. Because as a, as a public-private partnership, Hawaii Green Growth works with all of our communities. So we have our, we actually have representation from all of our counties, um, our city and county of Honolulu, Maui, Hawaii Island, um, and so this actually shows what we're talking about as a kako effort of everybody together. But as, as Tony said, um, we think that uh, you know, today's demonstration of subnational leadership is really extraordinary. So I do want to acknowledge all of our colleagues here and the, you know, the wonderful work they're doing across academia and the political spectrum um, and the array of actions in the US that demonstrate models that can be replicated and grown. So I've been asked to talk about Hawaii's approach. I think there's sort of three elements to what we're doing. It's developing locally and culturally appropriate metrics and indicators. Then we're measuring and tracking progress continuously on an open data platform. And actually this leads to concrete actions and we've heard some really exciting um, examples today of what that looks like. So I would say Hawaii is a leader in localizing SDGs but what we talk about is local solutions to achieve these global goals. That's the way we talk about it at home. And so our approach we established in 2014. A group of stakeholders got together representing a variety of sectors, energy, food, waste. Um, and we identified six statewide sustainability goals that cut across these various sectors. And then we developed locally and culturally appropriate metrics and indicators to measure progress. And we continue to work across these different um, areas to um, drive concrete action. This is called the Aloha Plus Challenge launched in 2014, a year prior to the SDGs. I mentioned we have a public and private partnership platform, the Open Data Dashboard to measure progress. This includes both quantitative and qualitative data as we realize some things you just can't actually put a number or a figure on. Um, our effort was early um, and it was public and private from the start. The Open Data Platform is available on the state.gov website. I encourage you all to look at it. We're constantly working with our network to say, are we measuring what matters? And when we undertook our effort, we actually went statewide. We convened with our civil society partners, our fish pond operators, our executives from our airlines, our mayors. We got everybody together. It would take us a long time to figure out. Actually, it might be impossible for everybody in this room to choose one place to have dinner tonight. Imagine trying to track what green workforce and education looks like. But we did this at the local level. We're tracking AINA-based education. We're looking at the Ahupua'a model for Hawaii and how we look at watershed management. The second key point is we have unparalleled political coherence. This effort involves our four mayors and the governor, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the University of Hawaii, our Hawaii Community Foundation has been a key supporter, um, and our civil society partners. So this is a joint commitment to align the SDGs through our Aloha Plus Challenge framework. We all agree that this is good for Hawaii and that we have something special to offer given our unique background. So today, um, our sustainability business forum that we convene that includes a diversity of partners and our CEO. We're launching an exciting initiative with our local nature conservancy office in Hawaii to pilot the first carbon offset in the state. So we anticipate this will be an 8,000 acre reforestation effort, which we estimate will generate 120,000 credits within the first 10 years. In addition, they have signed on to an energy efficiency audit 
Um, and now their CO2 savings and cost savings are being tracked and measured on the dashboard. And they've already achieved $4 million in, uh, 4 million in kilowatt hours in aggregate savings as a result of signing on to this. But the key issue is they want to be tracked on the dashboard. They want to show that unprecedented accountability and transparency. But who else is the dashboard serving? The dashboard, as I said, not only has quantitative metrics, but qualitative. And it's really important for us to engage our youth. And we heard from our, our colleagues. So we partnered up with a local school group, a network of school groups that were actually uh, diverting their food waste for over two years. And we talked to them, and we saw that they were tracking their data on a, on a whiteboard. So we said, could we actually work with you to develop an app? And they were actually selling the compost um, to the garden club for quite a high price and then reinvesting that in their food waste diversion program. We worked with them to develop an app. And now the students are actually taking that data, putting it onto the Aloha Plus Challenge dashboard, which directly rolls up to the SDGs. And now they feel like they have agency and they feel like they're actually part of a global movement and really making a change. So we're very excited about that. We're also convening partners to support Hawaii's goal to achieve 30% nearshore marine management by 2030. Um, as ocean's health is the foundation of our economy and our economic well-being and our way of life and our sustainable tourism activities. And we're working with partners to develop green and resilient infrastructure investments to reduce waste and advance water, energy, food nexus priorities, which islands actually have a really good story to tell. So we're working across all of our SDGs. And SDG 17, partnerships, is a key component of what we do. Finally, um, we believe that this is a collective challenge that we're all facing. So it actually needs collective action. And so we are committed to working with our neighbors, um, local, regional, and national. Last year, as part of the launch of the Local 2030 initiative, um, Deputy Secretary Mina Mohammed's leadership, Hawaii was actually recognized as a Local 2030 Islands Hub. So we were the only island hub, the first in the Pacific. And we were actually asked to work with other island economies and coastal areas to develop, again, locally and culturally appropriate metrics and indicators that resonate with local communities and how that actually rolls up to achieve the global goals. Um, so we've aligned our island and host culture values, which are grounded in core values of aloha, kuleana, to steward, malama, to care for, Aloha you'll find in our, in our SDG pin. And we've aligned our island values with American values, which are community-oriented and a commitment to the common good. So this Thursday, we'll be convening with other islands for the Island Strong, uh, excuse me, the Climate Strong Islands Initiative, where we're convening with islands across the United States. This is everybody from Martha's Vineyard uh, to Guam and Saipan to the Florida Keys and Hawaii. And we're actually looking at what US leadership through an island lens looks like. And why is this important? Because we think that islands have something important to share. On Friday, we're launching a global network, a local 2030 islands network, which will include president from Seychelles, um, Marshall Islands, excuse me, Micronesia, Guam, Ireland. And we're showing that this leadership is local, regional, and looking at island economies across the board. There's a Hawaiian pr proverb, he va'a he moku, he moku he va'a. The canoe is an island, and the island is a canoe. So in Hawaii, we've always been aware of the sense of finite resources and really the need to manage this in what people are calling a circular economy, we call an island economy. And these are not new solutions to islands. They date back thousands of years. And what we're actually doing is by looking at what is culturally relevant and appropriate to communities better able to stimulate global action. Or as President Romangas of Palau once said, we are all islanders living on island earth. And how islanders can actually help to um, share this island worldview. So I would like to join, uh, actually invite you to join our effort um, to spread an island worldview across America and the world to achieve our collective goals. And I look forward to working with you all this week. And congratulations and good luck with everything everybody is doing. So aloha and mahalo. Thank you, Celeste. And uh, I'm pleased now to bring to the stage Mayor, Mayor Bill Peduto from Pittsburgh. Uh, we'll engage in a conversation. Uh, he got here in a very sustainable way. Uh, 
<laughs> he ran. <laughs> Cab about uh, two miles up the street. <laughs> Just. Here, why don't we come into the Thank you. So, thank you very much, and thank you, Mayor, for being here. Thank, thank you for accommodating. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your for your efforts to be with you. And and we heard a little earlier from uh, from uh, many colleagues and and leaders uh, in the from the city of Pittsburgh, sort of the commitments they're making through their institutions on the SDGs, and also the spirit of collaboration that really happens in Pittsburgh. But I guess it would be interesting also to get from your perspective, um, and you've been working on a, a new city strategy, 1PGH, mm -hmm. um, you know, why, why the SDGs? Why, why is it important for 1PGH to sort of reflect the SDGs? What's the connection? What does it mean to the city of Pittsburgh? Well, I, uh, Pittsburgh's blessed because we have such a strong foundation community. We're the second largest philanthropic city in the United States. Uh, the only other one having a guy named Gates that lives there. And the fact is, is that was the wealth that we built through the second industrial revolution and it didn't leave. And there was a commitment back to the city that became so much more strengthened when the economy collapsed uh, because the need was there to hold the city's head above the water and it's still there today. Uh, the city reemerges. it's eds and meds, and the institutions now are not only the rudder of where this new economy is going, but they're the engine as well, and they realize that. And there is this commitment to looking at how we can create our own resiliency plan. How can we be able to create a plan that's going to recognize those constant stresses, racial inequity, environmental degradation, poverty and all of the symptoms of it, and then how do we recognize the shocks, the economic collapses, the landslides, the man-made disasters, the natural disasters, and put together a strategy that we invest now and we don't wait to be able to do it. So as the UN was looking at the 17 different areas of the SDGs, the city of Pittsburgh was looking at 10 areas of what we called 1PGH, and they align perfectly. What they do is they follow very basic principle. We need to invest in our infrastructure, and we need to invest in people. And if we look at all the ways that we can do that, it's a holistic approach that allows us to address and minimize negative impact. Now, when we bring that to a corporate audience, the first reaction is always the same. You can't do more than three things. Pick one. What's, what's your most important, pre-K? Eradicating hunger, creating a green infrastructure for your combined sewer overflow, pick one. You know, and then we'll invest in it. And that model does not work. That model is more of a way to be able to say, look, we did something, but we really didn't address the whole problem. And I think that is the importance of the UN SDGs. The UN SDGs let us look at economics and say these things are not externalities, but need to be a part of the equation at the beginning. And if we make them a part of the equation at the beginning and how we make decisions, we end up with a better world. That's very interesting. So thank, thanks for that. So it's, it's, um, it's looking systematically and systemically. Yes. Um, a, and, uh, it's the same way of saying it. And um, talk a little bit about it too, because I know in, in the city strategy, as, you, as you've thought about it, um, you're trying to measure. I mean, you're trying to hold yourself accountable to to, to these outcome-based benchmarks and measure what your progress is like and be transparent about that, whether it's going as fast as you want it, at, at whether progress is happening as quickly as you want it to or not. What, why is it important to sort of hold yourself to, to, to account in that way and to be transparent about it? In a sports town like Pittsburgh, there's an old saying, if you're not measuring, you're just practicing. <laughs> so... You need to be able to see where you are and not only where you want to go to. It's like taking a trip across the country and you set up different cities you're going to visit along the way. Those benchmarks become just as important as the final goal because they show you're getting there. We just put out a, a release last week. Um, we worked with the University of Pittsburgh in our Gender Equity Commission uh, we're one of six cities that have adopted this UN CEDAW uh, principles of uh, uh, opposing discrimination against women in all forms. And when we put the report out, what we found is at the intersection of gender and race, 
Pittsburgh does horrible. The, our rates of infant mortality with black women is almost at a third world level. Uh, and we can also track that on different issues to the point that we said at our press conference, you would have a much better life with education, health, and income if you're black and lived in other benchmark cities. You have to tell the bad news too, because if you don't tell the bad news, no one's gonna believe the good news. And um, I think that when you put out the information, especially when the information is not in a positive note, it brings more trust as you start to do the other part. And what you said with 1PGH, it wouldn't matter if we put out, and we have 10 areas, 47 specific projects that we need to do, and then where we need to be through uh, a 12-year plan. That's, that would be great, but if we aren't measuring it every year. So we have reached out to RAND Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1908, the first socioeconomic study of any city was conducted. It was called the Pittsburgh Survey. You can go back and look at it. It, it was groundbreaking in that it did two things. Number one, it showed the disparity of the workers and the mines and the mills and the conditions they were living in under quantifiable um, research. But it also began the progressive movement in the city of Pittsburgh uh, because it also showed where the government was corrupt and not addressing those issues. Uh, we want to create the Pittsburgh Survey 2.0 and it would be a yearly indicator on 1PGH exactly what we've done and exactly how it succeeded or not. That's a, that, that's a wonderful commitment. Thanks for your leadership on that. Um, so you just mentioned even the, the University of Pittsburgh and the, the work that you were doing on, on gender. And we have um, colleagues here, and they were talking about the way in which collaboration happens uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. So talk a little bit about how the, the kind of planning that you're talking about and the kind of transparency around where Pittsburgh is on particular targets and benchmarks then opens the door a little bit for, for the contributions and the collaboration and the coordination that, that we've been talking about here. So it goes beyond just the benefit to the people of Pittsburgh. This has a direct benefit to the institutions that are partners with it. With the University of Pittsburgh, we have a uh, unique partnership with the Department of Energy. So the Swanson School of Engineering, the University of Pittsburgh, the Department of Energy are working on district energy models, piloting old steam systems to become cogeneration to provide heat and electricity, working on building out entirely new models of district energy for 178 acres of land controlled by the foundation to be powered all with renewable energy as the development continues all on site. Being able to work around the Penguins area in creating a district energy plan that is based first on gas, but then with the transition to renewable. That type of a partnership has a direct benefit to the University of Pittsburgh in being able then to partner with companies to create these pilots and using the city as an urban lab to create new portfolios for companies that may be invested in the fossil fuel industry today, but recognize that in 40 years they want to be in renewable energy as well. And we can do it at a local basis. We do the same thing with Carnegie Mellon, partnering with the Hillman Foundation to come up with new ways to make traffic move so that idling time can be reduced by 32%, that traffic signals are based in an entire network that are already communicating with the vehicles. And being able to use our streets as an urban lab, but giving their faculty and their researchers a real ta tangible way to create a product and then to produce that product in Western Pennsylvania. And we might want to bring that model to New York City during UNGA week. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes. Or gondolas. I was thinking a gondola would be so great right here. Um, so, so let's just end with, so we've been talking a lot about the benefits to the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm and the way in which that leadership really manifests itself for your own, your constituents, your, the local citizens and, and the neighborhoods where you are. What's the, what's the value of connecting up to this global framework? And, and what does it provide, you know, sort of aligning uh, against the SDGs, something that was, you know, negotiated, adopted at the, under the auspices of the UN um, by nation states? What, what does it provide 
to you as a mayor or, or to, to your team and, and to the city as a whole to be sort of connected up with this global framework and, and why is it important and what, what does that mean? Also in terms of just sort of um, what it means for the U.S. and U.S. leadership to, to be displayed and demonstrated on that. I think the world changed um, during the Paris Agreement. That, that was the, during the Paris Agreement, if you didn't know, that was the largest gathering of mayors in the history of this world. Over 500 mayors gathered, and this is what we said. It was a very simple message. We're already doing it. We got this covered. The water's warm. Jump on in. And there was no pun intended about warm water, by the way. <laughs> but what we wanted to say is it really doesn't matter what you do at the national level because the implementation, especially on the environmental issues, are going to be impacted and will be done at a local level. And the vast majority of the reduction of carbon footprint has to happen by cities. It's the same way if we look at a refugee crisis. And mayors can actually determine to a number the number of people that we can bring in and to be able to help them and to be able to spread it so that we can deal with these types of crises. We're much more equipped to deal with these global issues than national governments. And that shouldn't be surprising because that was the way that most of civilization lived. It's just recently that we've come up with this idea that big governments of major land should have that uh, responsibility. So my, my message is very simple. It, it is that as we look at uh, the issues of the SDGs, uh, a network that is based um, primarily upon cities, institutions, philanthropic institutions, and corporations could change this world more than national governments. If they adopt and stick to these principles, we can eradicate hunger on this planet. We can eradicate poverty. We have the ability to deal with the real issues of climate change and migrant change that will be occurring over the next several decades. And those tools simply require the institutions that I mentioned to implement them. And here's the best part. You don't need permission. You can do it. You can have your university do it. You can fund the organizations to help them to be able to meet those goals. And you can require of your own elect, uh, local elected officials that they adopt them. Our goal in Pittsburgh is very simple. We want to be the second American city to formally adopt the UN SDGs, and we plan to do it this month. All right. I think that's a note for us to to bring this uh, gathering to a close. I want to thank you for your leadership and for your willingness to be here and for your extra effort to be here with us this morning. Um, I hope all of you have heard uh, uh, and, and learned a little bit about what's going on across the U.S. in terms of how the SDGs are relevant to our communities and to the U.S., but also how the work that different segments of American society are doing on the SDGs also reflects back on the uh, global leadership that the U.S. can provide as well. I really, uh, it, it's so gratifying and inspiring to see the room packed and the interest in this. Um, it's so inspiring to hear about the work that's going on uh, at the local level from the commitments that we heard um, made earlier in Pittsburgh and, and in New York and Hawaii, um, from the global leadership that institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation and Verizon Corporation um, are projecting. Uh, and so I would just challenge all of you to, to look within and say, what can we be doing on this agenda? I know many of you in the room are doing this and our leaders and, um, and at Brookings will continue to work to help aggregate that and support that with research and analysis to take it further. Thanks again to the UN Foundation, our partners in putting this on. And Casey, hats off to you. And where's Krista? Krista, who's like been the magician behind everything. Thank you, Krista, um, for keeping us, um, keeping us organized. And thanks to all of you. And have a great week. Take this forward. Keep inspiring as you go throughout the week up here in New York. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.